So welcome to Slack Chat podcast, episode three. We've got me, who is Stuart Winter, talking about himself in the third person. <laughs> I don't really know why, but that's how we've started. And um, I've switched back to the first person now because it makes more sense. And I'm the Slackware ARM architect, developer and engineer and so on and so forth. And we've got Phil, who is the maintainer of SARPI, which is an extension of Slackware ARM, so you can install uh, Slackware ARM on your Raspberry Pi. And the purpose of this podcast, if you haven't listened to the other ones, I suggest you do that first because it might make a bit more sense. But if you haven't done that and you don't want to, then simply I'll tell you that the purpose of this podcast is that Phil and I have been talking about, I was helping him with some of the SARPI stuff, and we thought we'd have a chat about that kind of stuff on here and whatever else comes up in conversation. But the, the scope of the conversations are limited to Slackware or more Slackware. So if you're expecting anything else, <laughs> you won't get much else more than outside of that. That was a long description, Phil. I don't know how much we're going to edit out of that, but <laughs> yeah. I hope it makes sense <laughs> as, as a sort of summary of what we're doing. Thank you very much, Stu. That's a very kind introduction again. Yeah, I've I've got a problem. I've got a problem that I wouldn't mind discussing with you, and it, it involves installing Slackware 64. It, it goes absolutely perfectly up until the point where the eLilo is going to write to the eLilo conf, and then it comes up with an error. EFI boot manager, error while loading shared libraries, lib EFI VAR dot SO dot one cannot open shared object file, no such file or directory. Right. Okay, so what you've just told me is so this ha actually happens in the installer. Yes. Ah. Yes. I've never installed that it on a says install boot install boot menu entry. Would you like to install a boot menu entry so that you can easily select Slackware when you boot your machine? Warning. Do not install a boot menu entry on Apple hardware. So you click on OK, and then it comes up with the dreaded error at the bottom of the screen. OK. I've never installed that. I've never seen that part of yeah. the installer. I, have, I don't but, have it yet. <clears throat> that, is but, my, that is my conundrum at the moment. I know it's not, it's not Slackware ARM related, uh, but this whole new thing of, of UEFI and, um, and GUIDs and GPT partitions and all this it's it's something i don't deal with a lot so i'm having to learn as i go okay i it sounds to me though initially because it's inside the installer that the installer is broken that's what it sounds like what did you say the name of that module was the the, the, the link library it was complaining right. about lib efi var dot s o for orange dot one okay efi var oh i see mm-hmm so what it's saying that it's not it doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, cannot open shared object file, no such file or directory. If the the installer, um, the installer that I'm using, I'm, I'm, it's actually a U, USB boot, and I dragged the oh, okay. U, USB boot image off the um, Slackware source media DVD in the ISO Linux directory, and I just wrote it to a, a USB oh, pen. Okay. Where's the USB? So I only look at the ISO. I was looking, I just unpacked the ISO Linux initrd.img and that, that, that shared library is in there. Yep. In user lib 64. So, but you're not using that one you just told me. So which no. one? No. In Slackware 64 current ISO Linux directory, there is, and I hope I'm not telling you fibs here. I can see it. Yeah, the USB. I've used that a while ago. Yeah, here. USB boot. And I wrote that to a USB pen. And that's what I use to uh, to run the installer. I can't yeah, I'm not sure. So I've just unpacked the latest one for Slackware 64, the USB. So I just uh, loop back mounted the image file and then copied the initrd off of that and then unpacked it. And I use CMake for that, Stuart. CMake? Yeah, CMake, option, capital E for echo, tar, XF, and then the image file. So you can have a look in the. Hmm? Did you did you get that correctly? No, we are C talking about different things because tar, unless tar now supports CPIO archive extraction, so I I, I XZ cat the image into CP into tar 
So no, I don't. I XZ cat it, which is actually XZ and pack yeah. it to standard output, and then dump it into CPIO dash DI, and that unpacks. Right. Yeah, because CP it's a CPIO archive, so CPIO unpacks it onto the file system, and then I've got access to the installer. I'm not sure what you were, because then the first thing is you needed to mount. I needed to mount I the image, will, image as a loopback device. I'll co I'll copy and paste this to you. Maybe I'm old school. Maybe there are tools that oh, do stuff that I don't no. know how to do or I, write it manually. I am pretty damn certain that, that your your methods are more orthodox than mine. Um, That's just about what works. <laughs> yeah. But I've pasted, I've, I've pasted that to you in the screen. That's the, an example of the, the command that I would use. What? Okay. What is this? So if you, if you what are you blowing up? The USB boot image? Yeah, initially. And then yeah, it, just... Okay. I'm going to reserve a judgment. I think we're talking about different things here. So, like, for example, if I... Sh I'll tell you what, I'll share my screen and we can see. So, what, <laughs> no one else can obviously see that's listening to the podcast. What we're actually... I'm, we're trying to figure out why um, why Elilo is not working. And I've gone into the Slackware 64 current slash ISO Linux directory, which is where uh -huh. the installer is. Yeah. And I've tried uh, Phil's th suggestion. So I'm not really sure what, what that was all about. <laughs> Well, I, I, I use the, I, I use the image, the uh, the init RD. I use that to boot the system, uh, you know, to get into the installer. Yeah, but, but this is so. This here, look. So inside the ISO Linux directory yeah. is an init RD dot IMG. That's what you know. That's what, for example, ITFTP boot. So I have that image file inside uh -huh. my TFTP boot directory. So I can boot. I can network boot Slackware x eighty six sixty four and, and x eighty six off of the network. So I've got yeah. the USB stuff, I've got, it's just you know, held down F12, boot off the LAN, type in Slack 64 and boots the installer. And mm -hmm. what it boots is this file here. And that's a LZMA compressed CPIO archive. So if you want to unpack it to see what's in the installer, make a directory and then do xzcat, but not like this, xzcat slash init, init mm -hmm. rd.image, cpio dash di and boom. There is the, ins the contents of the installer right there. So when you boot the installer, this is the directory. This is what you'll find inside of it. Right. Yeah, so I'm not quite sure what you were doing there, really. I think you were looking at some, doing something else. So that there's the installer. And if I look at the user lib64 directory and then do find, which there you'll find. What? Hmm. No. <laughs> is that because it's, oh, it's, it's not extracted? And, uh, well, whatever. Anyway. <laughs> There, you can see it on your screen yeah. there, right? So the file that. is there, and the sim link is is is, yeah. uh, is valid because it's not it's not broken. Okay, can you can you just do a PWD for me, please, Stuart? So that's so I've unpacked it. I've gone into the ISO Linux directory, yeah. made a temporary directory, unpacked the installer, and from here, from this point on, right. there, that's that's the installer, right? So I'm right. saying that Lilo should actually work. Mm -hmm. In fact, actually, if I chirrut into it, it should work because it's 64 bit, but it might not. Oh, it does. There we go. So. Oh, on hold the, yeah. on a minute. Right, I think I know what it is. What well, I may, I may know what it is. I bet because Elilo, if it is actually, let me see. I don't know anything about it, so I think is there actually a Slackware sixty four package called Elilo? Is that how it works? And it's probably in A series. Ah, my guess is what happened is. Are you manually selecting packages to install? Or are you installing everything? Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've missed, I've missed this one out, haven't I? Have. So if you look at the manifest, mm -hmm. what, was it called? what was it called again? EFI VAR or something, wasn't it? E yeah, EFI VAR, VAR. So, so what's going on is that yeah. the system, see, this doesn't work like this in ARM. You don't have any of these things. Uh -huh. What's going on is that when Elilo runs, the script must be chirruting into your, or some, some equivalent of that. It's probably, it maybe is actually chirruting into the, into the newly installed operating system and it's running Lilo from in there. And because it's restricted to, the, to that environment, whether it's Chirut or some other method, it's probably, it's got to be Chirut. It's running, it's, it's looking for the library, that EF5R shared object inside the new operating system. And it mm -hmm. can't find it because you haven't installed it. Right. So you need to go back and make sure that you've got this package installed and then sure. Lilo will actually work. Excellent. Yeah, so there's nothing to do with the installer at all. Excellent. That no is... idea how that's going to turn out for anyone on the podcast, but because uh, you can't see the screen, but uh, yeah, yeah, basically he hasn't got. He, he's not installed. He's managed. Phil has managed selected the installation, which is I do as well. I usually spend quite a while trimming down the uh, uh, trimming down the installation, and he hasn't mm -hmm. installed the ACE, the package called EFI VAR, which resides in the A series, so the Elilo can't run because it's missing that 
uh, yeah. shared library dependency. So that should, there you go, that should fix it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thank you. I think I might actually do a full install and then that would be a lot better. So Slack Query is probably, as you know, is designed with the intent of having, um, with being fully installed. So that's kind of one of the ways out of the dependency quagmire. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you can, but, but you can get, the thing is, you can get away with, um, I've gone to servers I used to run. If you ran a if you ran a script to check for broken dependencies, you'd find plenty of them. But it didn't hamper the machine. It didn't hamper the user impact. Uh, sorry, the user experience whatsoever. Because you know you don't need not every part of a package needs to actually run. Are you familiar with the um, like the other the way other distributions provide shared objects packages? No. Right. So if you you know the the Slackware, there's a few of them in Slackware. There's the one called glibc so libs, open SSL so libs, and there may be another one which I can't remember. I've heard of all of those. Yeah. You know. Okay. There's a, there's a few of them. Uh, really, only really a handful of them. And the purpose of those is that they, the, the for example, in the case of glibc, everything really depends on that. Mm -hmm. So in some in some uh, at some level or another, and so you need to have the if you don't need the full glibc package installed unless you want to compile stuff. So you don't need to have the full glibc package installed, which is, I think, why also, the, I don't think the app Slack Query on mini root includes the full glibc package either for that reason. So what you really need to do is include the, is include the libraries upon, upon which the system depends, like the core libraries. So you can you can do that in Slackware, um, and it provides a few of those packages. But other the way that other distributions get out of some of the dependency issue is by build, like if you look at Fedora or, or Debian, and well, all of them really, as far as I know, the, the package distributions, they provide their version of a, of a Slackware SO libs package. So they just yeah. they do the same thing, but Slackware mostly doesn't do that. They're oh. mostly full packages. You know, if you want Kerberos, then you get everything. You get the headers file, you get a load of docs, you get a load of other stuff, and you get the shared libraries to make the whole thing actually run, to actually right. execute on the system. So that means in Slackware, you can install a lot of stuff that never gets used, potentially, but there's not always the, but sometimes you can not install certain packages and you'll find that, you know, bits of the package are broken. Let's say there's a particular binary that doesn't work because you haven't installed all the dependencies, but it doesn't matter because you're not using that binary. You never use it. Nothing mm -hmm. uses it. So you can be quite happy and just go, okay, well, my, all my other software that links to those libraries is working. But the, the, the full chain is broken, but it doesn't matter because nothing's at the end of the chain that's actually active. If that makes any sense. I don't know if that... Yeah, yeah. I mean, just to be fair, it's actually one of the things I like about Slack, where you install it and it works. You don't have to go and sort of hunt down a load of, you know, sort of de development versions of packages or anything like that. I really like quite like it from that point of view. Mm. You wanted to talk about... Um, oh, go on. What did you want to say? I was, I was just going to say glibc is something I'm quite familiar with because that's the software that always gives problems when I'm compiling the 64-bit tool chain and kernels. It just doesn't, it's not user-friendly for compiling, isn't glibc in 64-bit? Oh, it seems to be that way. It should be by now. Mm, should be. I think the, with the, the 5.4, yeah, definitely with the 5.4 kernel, I had to patch glibc because there was something giving an issue and it, it was something that really didn't matter. Well, you have to, there's a lot to learn about all this stuff. Yeah, yeah, there is. How are you getting on with the 64-bit stuff? The the 64-bit kernel and modules is running very, very well. It was designed to sort of prompt other users into getting interested in, in all things ARM64. And right. I don't know if it's had any effect in, in that respect, but uh, there certainly are a lot more people doing 64-bit things with Slackware, on, which is good. This is a question you should answer, but I don't know if it's really worth building a 64-bit um, Slackware ARM system, but it's never been tried, so that's purely why I would like to do it. Oh, yeah, do it. It's a learning exercise. Mm. It'd be a big learning exercise. Mm. Depends. I mean, I don't see, I don't, as we, I think we talked before, I don't, as I think we talked before, we, I just don't, this stuff comes down to a personal need. Mm. And I don't personally have a need for a 64-bit yeah. anything. I don't even own any 64-bit ARM machines right now. So mm -hmm. there's no need to do that. Whereas for the hardware float port, most of my new ARM devices were already, they had the hardware floating point unit on inside the uh, you know on, inside the system yeah. on the chip. So I was like, well, <laughs> that's a no-brainer, really. I can just yeah. go and build it. I think as ARM technology advances and, and gets faster, the 64-bit operating system will come into its own. But certainly at the minute, 
um, with the with the the power of them, uh, and I'm talking about single board devices such as the Orange Pi and Banana Pi. They need to they need to be a bit more powerful with more features to enable them to make use of a 64 bit system. I don't think the bandwidth yeah. there right now. So here's the thing, actually, I was thinking about this the other day. The original idea of the, the whole roots of the, of Slackware ARM. Actually, you know what? From now, from this moment on, I was thinking about this. I need to call it ARM Slack. It's just easier to say than okay. than Slackware ARM. It's, it's too it's too much. Like, right. It's a bit of a mouthful. So I'm going to call it ARM Slack. The original ARM name, uh, which I really like that name actually. Um, I only yeah. changed it when Patrick said that it was the official ARM port. So I just renamed yeah. it. But yeah. it's actually when you typing it is fine. Saying it is another thing. So I'll call yeah. it ARM Slack. So yeah, I, I was thinking about that because the original goal of it was to because I'd spent so much money on this strong arm, Acorn strong arm wrist PC. Like we're talking. No, one thousand five hundred pounds, which back in nineteen ninety six or seven or whatever, was was a, was a hell of a lot of money, especially for a nineteen year old or eighteen year old or something. Uh-huh. So basically, I looked at it and I was really like business minded, like this computer. I'm using Linux now because it's better than RISCOS, and it's more interesting. And I spent like one thousand five hundred pounds on this strong arm this PC with like expansion boards, expansion network cards, IDE expansion boards. And I really like the look of it. It looks really cool. And uh, I was like, well, there's got to be something I could do with this investment. Uh-huh. <laughs> Why did I put Slackware on it? Yeah. Because I already knew Slackware really well by then. So, and uh, so I was like, yeah, I could probably do that. So I just imagined, I thought to myself, yeah, I can, I knew enough people in the Debian world already, just because they also came from Riscos because it was ARM. So all the people that filtered into Debian ARM came from using Riscos, Acorn machines. So there was already a group of people that knew each other on IRC and, and things like that. And I met quite a few of them. So I already knew these people in Debian. I was like, okay, well, how do, does it work well? And they were telling me, yeah, well, Debian's all right. Kind of, you know, there's lots of hacks and things and patches. And so... I got mm-hmm. building Slackware for it. I just think, thought to myself, I can imagine the installer on the screen. There was no, that took years to come. Imagine the installer. And I, I just kept working towards the vision. And the vision was that I wanted to use my, a- my strong armrest PC as my desktop, but running Linux. However, little did I know that the, the what, what was a very snappy operating system, RISCOS, you know, written in basically 100% ARM assembly code, was, a, well, not entirely, but mostly, it was very, very snappy because they'd written it to the hardware, to the processor. Everything was like your hand-coded, a hand-coded right. ARM assembly built to yeah. re- really exercise the, the, that machine in, in a really good way, right? Whereas Linux isn't. It's compiled, uh, you know, and the, cur- and, the, and the compiler may or not be, I guess it wasn't particularly optimized for ARM back then. So the, what turned out wasn't the best ARM code. So the, basically what I'm saying is, is that I, I got it working on there, eventually got X working with some of the help from the Debian guys. And, and I was a little bit disappointed at just how slow it was. So, like for example, KDE loaded, KDE3 actually loaded and ran on my 287 megahertz strong arm wrist PC, which is, really? not, which is not a 287 megahertz Pentium by any means. I wish it yeah. was. It really isn't. You can't compare megahertz in ARM versus x86. They're incomparable. Well, you can kind of compare them, but there's some massive, there's some ratio there's some ordering factor there. It's a different design. It's so, different. Yeah. yeah. I remember one of the guys with, with the Guru, no, the Shiva plugs, the Kirkwood system on chip, he did some um, nice measurements and said that he reckons that a one gigahertz Kirkwood ARM processor was a 1.2, I don't know what it was, more or less one gigahertz. He said it's about it's about equivalent, according to his measurements, the various different benchmarks, he said it's about equivalent to a, Pentium, a 500 megahertz Pentium 3. Mm-hmm. Just to give you some indication of how yeah. much, how, how really you know, they're non-comparable. So I was there. So my goal was to get Slackware R, arm Slack, to get Slackware really running on the Riscos strong arm. No, sorry, the strong arm Risk PC. Because I was like, yeah, this is really cool, and I quite love the idea of doing it. And uh, but yeah, it was so slow because the, the arm stuff wasn't. It just wasn't. Linux just wasn't fast enough on arm. I'm kind of going off on one of this story. I don't know if it's interesting or not. But I want to bring one of the guys we want to bring. We talked about. Um, if people are interested in stuff, we could bring on guests. And one of the people yeah. I've, I've tapped up, I've, I've sown the seeds in his direction. Uh-huh. I wanted to bring on uh, Jorkins, Jim Hawkins, who was one of the, the guys credited in the first release of Arm Slack in, in 2004. I was looking at it the other day. Um, so he was one of the guys who really helped resolve blockers that I couldn't resolve, like kernel issues with drivers and things like that, and yeah. patching QMU so you could actually build GCC in it. Uh-huh. There was a bug in the implementation of this uh, ARM emulator. So he did all these like hardcore engineering, you know, guru fixing things. And one of the things, even before we, even before either of us got into Slackware, because Jim is also a Slackware user, one of the things we, we, used, to, we used to 
we both had Riscos machines, which is what, how the connection originally started. And so he was an arm hacker even back then, hacking arm code and stuff. And I gave him some software one day. And uh, you know, you know, when you load some soft, the commercial software and it puts this awful banner up on the screen while it's busy loading, right? The copyright yeah. nonsense and the stuff yeah. you just don't care about. Uh-huh. And it puts that on and no one likes the stuff as far as I can tell. <laughs> and I gave it to him because this software was crashing or something. And I said, what do you know what's wrong with this thing? He, uh, about a day later, emailed back a zip file with the software in it. And he goes, oh, I fixed it. And I've removed that stupid banner at the same time. And <laughs> I've actually optimized the ARM code because the C compiler, whoever the C compiler this is, doesn't make good ARM code. So you've actually gone through and uh, hand optimized the ARM yeah. code that the C compiler had produced. It's Problem solved. faster now yeah. and I've fixed it and I've got rid yeah. of the panel. But what's next? I'm just like, okay. That's cool. <laughs> So yeah. it just goes to show, you know, like the, when you layer all that stuff, non-optimization to non-optimized, badly optimized code, it's pretty slow. And getting right. back to the original thread is that uh, your 64-bit stuff. I was looking at the, um, I was looking at the Orange Pi the other day because I was reinstalling one of my old uh, build machines to bring it back up into line, and I was ra- I was running Firefox on it, and it's not that bad on the Orange Pi. I mean, I wouldn't want to say I would go web browsing with it. I mean, it does work, but it's still it's not fast enough, and even. You know, I don't even think having extra cores is it's not just not going to help, you know. But the, on the other hand, when you think about it, it's also because, you know, I'm sure that if Slackware ARM was highly optimized to that particular machine and Firefox was as well, you could probably get it running nicely because you've had Android devices that had this 32 bit ARM v7 hardware for ages. And that stuff works all yeah. right, doesn't it? Yeah. So there are extra. It's not that it's the same hardware, but it's still an arm under there and there's still, you know, like extra bits you can add to the system, extra bits of hardware. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, like um, hardware features that you can add. So it's not that the arm isn't capable of running software fast. It just needs to be highly optimized and targeted, which, which like whereas ar- arm slack isn't because it's a general, dist- it's a general uh, use distribution. And on the 64 bit stuff, I don't know, it depends really. I mean, it's all to do, 64 bits really about generally about the amount of RAM you need. It's not mm-hmm. necessarily always the case, but, if it's, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't rule out myself doing one at some point, but certainly mm-hmm. not at the moment, not with not with my other work. Yeah. Like I say, there's, there's various people taking that forward and doing their own development of 64-bit packages and, and software. And, um, it's, it's good. It's, I think it's really good that people go off the, the main track and go their own way and try their own thing with Slackware because it affords you that freedom. Um, I certainly have, you know, I've I've gone in, in directions that maybe I shouldn't have gone, and it, it's it's all education. That's that's why I do it. I love the education. Yeah, you mean your self education? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think. Well, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I do it as well. I mean, actually, I was gonna I'm gonna put on the arm Slackware arm. I will call it Slackware arm now because it is the Slackware arm website. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm gonna put on the Slackware arm website a, a, that arm. PDF. I'll link to where it is because the author, the original author of it, seems to be quite happy with opening it up. Um, and uh, yeah, because I was I was looking at this ARM assembly manual that I had years ago, and I'd thrown it in a bin because it was so old. And it, it came from the Riscos world, where you could write ARM Basic or Riscos, BBC Basic, but I'm running on the ARM, so it's a very good Basic, yeah. it's a very complete Basic. And you could have inline ARM assembly, so it was geared because that's the easiest way, and it's, it was a free. You just wrote Basic, do it, puts a Basic in. Uh, you wrap some assembly around some basic, which basically does a four next loop to do the uh, the assembly to run the assembly to do the multiple passes you need for assembly language, and uh, so it's geared around that. So I was like, oh, well, I don't need that anymore. I'll put it in the bin. I don't use Riscos. It's in the loft. <laughs> but then, then I suddenly realised the other day. I just thought, oh, I wonder what that book's like. So I would have loved to have got into doing ARM assembly. I did try, but it was like a bit beyond me at the time. Yeah. And I found that I actually just googled the book and happened to find it, and uh, and I read it, and it's so straightforward. Mm-hmm. It's so well written, so I'm going to put that. I'm going to put that on there, and also it's it's actually ARM assembly language. It doesn't matter that it's the, the examples are around using BASIC in RISCOS. It doesn't really matter. The ARM code is ARM code. Yeah. It's all it's for very old ARM for ARM v3 because that's what there was when he, when he wrote the book. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, it's like well, those those instructions are still there. You know, mm-hmm. it's not like they went away. It's just that the new yeah. ones came as well. So uh, yeah, I find that. So anyway, that, my point was I find that really interesting as well. It's I like the fact that for example, ARM has been blocked for a, what for. A, a week or more now, probably a little bit longer than that, because of Guile version three that was introduced. And I was, but the, so this is one of the interesting things. Is one this, for me, it's also educational. So I think of it from the architect, architectural point of view and planning point of view, and I'm like, well, okay, Guile is 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 broken. It's not necessarily a problem. Firefox breaks, but okay, whatever. I could just leave it until it works yeah. again. It doesn't matter because 
it's just Firefox. It doesn't it doesn't block anything because it's at the end of the chain. It's at the end of the line. You know, it doesn't matter if it falls off a cliff. <laughs> it's like because nothing else around it is linking to Firefox. But Guile isn't the same. So Guile has three or four at least packages that link against Guile. So that means that and they had to be rebuilt for the Guile version three. Right. So the problem is, is that Guile doesn't build anymore on ARM. It has a legal instruction, which seems to be it's just just does at least on V7. I was looking. It's other people have found the same thing. So, which is always always a good thing when other people find it that's not in ARM Slack. Uh-huh. Like, okay, that gives me confidence. And <laughs> so I look at that, you know, because because someone else okay, maybe someone else will fix this thing. I tried. I looked at it. I was like, I can't see what the problem is. Sometimes it, you know the compiler. It, sometimes the auto, the, the automated detection detects things that aren't on my system and it. It adds in compiler flags to produce code for instructions that don't exist on my arm, on my arm architecture that I run. So, but that wasn't the case. Yeah. So, so okay. So, Guile, anyway, basically, Guile is broken, and things link against it. So, what am I going to do? I can either try and isolate Guile and these set of packages and carry on building the rest of it, but really, that means that I'm kind of out. Of, I don't know exactly what extent Guile, what other things may depend on Guile. That that that's yeah. Aren't, uh, that aren't shown by a link by a search for the link mm-hmm. library. So it's like, okay, you know what? Actually, it's a good. This is how the podcast came about. Like, you know, actually, I'm just going to see what happens. I'm going to take a step back, stop developing it for a bit, <laughs> and just do something else. Uh, yeah. And wait till Guile gets fixed. Do I figure out how to fix Guile? As mm-hmm. it happens, I've managed to. I read. I, re, I read someone else's debug of the issue of, on the, of the distribution, and they, and for a different package, they said just to say I just disable the just in time compiler for Guile, right? And so I was like. I know what a just in time compiler is, and that makes sense. So I, I disabled it and built Guile, and Guile builds. So it means that Guile's probably going to be really, really slow when it runs. Yeah. Because, but so what? You know, <laughs> I'm sure that won't be a problem. I'll just rebuild Guile later when someone's patched it and fixed it. <laughs> but the interesting part about this is, is that I was like, you know, actually, I do, what, I do know what a just in time compiler is, but I can never explain it to anyone. I know enough about what it is to go, ah, that makes sense. Now I can understand the, the JIT compiler's right, it's building. Either it's building some binary with ARM instructions that don't exist on mine, or perhaps it's something's corrupted and it's trying to execute some data, which actually, you know, thinking it's an instruction, but it's actually just data, and so it crashes because it's, it's not an instruction. And so I thought, oh, okay, who knows? So then I started reading about just-in-time compilers. So I was like, oh, let me have a look at that. Okay. So basically, you know, it's, it is it's a constant education process. And even though it's kind of hard work at some times, I mean, because maintaining a distribution is a lot of work. I think that I mean, you know, for your, I mean, I've done all the talking here, but like from your side, you, in, it's all, it's all, it's all relative to what your current knowledge is. And like for you, some, so for example, if I was doing, I don't mean it's in a bad way. I'm just saying, right? I just, it's the same for me as well. Is that if I was doing SARPY, it'd probably be I'd do it a lot faster, because I've got a lot more experience about Unix, Linux, and distributions in general. So I would find it easier. So it would be faster. But at the same time, you, I can say that about me. Go well. Hang on, I've just found something that's crashed. How am I going to fix that? I don't know enough about ARM assembly to fix to even really try and figure out what the what, what is the instruction it's calling anyway. And okay, and even if even if I identified it, would I be able to go? Oh, actually, yeah, I can see what the problem is. This instruction does this in this newer ARM, but I could emulate it by writing a load of other five instructions or mm. some other. You see what I mean? I'm not at that level to be able to do that. Jim is. Jim Hawkins can do it. That's how we. <laughs> that's how we got me through. How we got, you know, without him, Slackware arm, arm Slack wouldn't have existed. I would yeah. have got a certain way, but I couldn't get further because I was simply incapable of fixing it at that time. Yeah. So the question was, is like, you know, from your side, I guess this, you know, just working on SARPY takes quite a long time, right? It can do. Most of the work goes into the, the, the kernel and the firmware. And if you've got new, uh, new firmware, You've got to make sure that the the right modules in the kernel uh, are supported. That's that's what takes the most time. The building and and, and everything else that's all done by by bash scripts. But the bash scripts aren't intelligent enough to know what modules are needed in the kernel. So yeah, if you're asking exactly how much time, I would say maybe one to two hours a day when it's when it's necessary. Oh okay. Yeah, it's probably about the same for Arm Slack at the moment. Mm. Once, because I've automated so much. Yeah. But even actually, I just I just did fifty six packages. I, I grabbed in all of the updates into my, for the my update tool, and the only one that I actually did, had to really work on was uh, PHP. Oh, was it I, I'm at, you know, Alpine? Right. A little bit PHP and 
adding the Kerberos 5 package. But other than that, my build scripts just plowed through all the rest of it and it uh -huh. updated everything and just set them going. Yeah. So it didn't, but that's taken a lot of work to get to that point. And that concludes episode three of the podcast. And this conversation will be continued in episode four.